Do you feel a shiver up your spine from fear? Yes, it's another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind. Amp up your imagination and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The Haunted Woodshed by Harold R. Daniels Through 30 years of school teaching, Mary Comstock dreamed of the day she could retire to a small New England village and live out her remaining years quietly raising dahlias. She might even, she dreamed, be accepted into some small intellectual group so that there would be evenings of good conversation and music. The house that she actually bought was not in a village, but was located half a mile from it. It had been a farm and the price was far less than a similar house in town would have cost. Even so, it took more of her small savings than she would have liked. Two acres of land went with a house. She would, she told herself, raise her own vegetables and perhaps have a few left over for sale at the roadside. She bought the house after two weekends inspection visits. Mr. Purcell, a real estate agent who went with her on the visits, wasted much time fussily pointing out the merit to the house. Wasted it because Mary was in love with the house from the moment she saw it. It was a dignified little white salt box in excellent condition. Having seen it, Mary knew that no other house could possibly meet her needs so exactly, except for the woodshed. She didn't like that from the start and actually came to fear it. The fear began a week after she said her goodbyes to her fellow teachers. They gave her a silver-plated tea set and moved to Morrow Corners. Mary Comstock, at that time, was in her late 50s, a small, indomitable figure of a woman not given to foolish fears. She had faced down too many classes of bullying boys, too many stuffed shirt school boards to be a coward. The woodshed was perhaps 20 feet long by 15 feet wide. It was made of heavy, unpainted planks that had mellowed and silvered with the season. There was a wide, heavy door in the front and a tiny window in the back. It was actually a rather picturesque little building, and Mary did not understand quite what it was she disliked about it. Certainly, the proportions were neat enough. She had glanced into it on her first visit to the farm, but she did not go inside it until a week after she had moved and had finished setting up her own furniture. She told herself that she was not really avoiding the woodshed. There were simply too many other things to attend to. At the end of the first week, she went out to inspect it. There was a crude bar and socket arrangement on the door so arranged that the bar would ride up on a sloping wedge and drop into the socket if the door was slammed hard enough. She lifted the free end of the bar from the socket and pulled the door back. It creaked and held back against her pull, as if reluctant to open. When she released, the door swung back as if to close again. She said in small impatience, Darn thing! and pulled it all the way open so that it banged against the shed wall and shivered to a standstill. Mary was a sensitive and imaginative woman. When she stepped from the brilliant sunshine into the gloom of the woodshed, she was almost overwhelmed by a feeling of melancholy so tangible that it was almost like a blow. She recoiled from it, and only a fine sense of the ridiculous kept her from retreating back to the sunlight that now seemed the brighter by contrast. She said aloud, and her own voice startled her. Sha, Mary Comstock, it's only an old woodshed. You act as if it were Madame Tussauds but she had to force herself to remain in the building. It seemed almost bucolically harmless. The floor was of hard-packed dirt, embedded with countless wood chips and scraps of bark. Thin light came through the tiny window, high up on the wall. Dust motes danced in a brighter bar of sunlight. A lonesome blue-bottle fly droned wearily against the dusty glass, butting his head against it fatalistically. She stayed in the shed for ten minutes or so, planning its possible rearrangement into a potting shed. 
She left it before she was done with her planning, and she scolded herself for this as she slammed the heavy door. Poltergeists, witches, haunts, you should be ashamed of yourself. Next you'll be looking for elves down in the orchard. Nevertheless, she did not go near the woodshed for another week, because she told herself she was much too busy. From time to time, she would glance at the woodshed from the house or the yard, and each time she shivered and felt cold. Shame made her visit the building again. When she opened the door, she felt the same sense of overpowering, lurking evil. She stayed only five minutes on that second occasion, and it took all her considerable willpower to make her remain that long. The next time, she drove into Morrow Corners in the little coop that had been a personal friend for a dozen years. She stopped in at the office of Ben Purcell, the real estate man who had sold her the house. He seemed nervous when she sat down across the desk from him. I hope everything is going well, Mrs. Comstock. He said, no leaks in the roof or anything like that. It hasn't rained since I bought the house, she reminded him. And it's Miss Comstock, as you should remember, from the deed papers. I wish you'd stop fidgeting, Mr. Purcell. I bought the house and I'm perfectly happy with it. I merely want to know who lived there before I did. Purcell looked relieved. Why, Henry Winowski had the place before you did. Miss Comstock, of course, he deeded it over to the bank to sell for him two years ago when he moved to the big plot farm he bought. Mighty good farmer, Henry is. I don't care what the talk was. What talk? Purcell mopped his forehead with an outsized handkerchief. Oh, just talk. Didn't amount to anything. Mary leaned forward. I taught school for 30 years. Mr. Purcell, I'm not an easy woman for even a grown man to fool. What are you hiding back about my house? Did some tragedy take place there? Purcell said anxiously. No tragedy, exactly. It's just that Mrs. Wanowski disappeared. Let's see, that was five years ago? There was a lot of talk that Henry did away with her. Nothing was ever proved, though. Did they arrest him? Sure. Held him for a while, but they couldn't find any evidence. So they had to let him go. He went straight back to his place, your place now, and lived on there until he bought the platform. Purcell paused. I hope you don't think I wouldn't have told you all this if you'd asked Miss Comstock. She stood up to leave. I'm sure you would, she said dryly. Because she was reasonably stubborn, Mary Comstock went into the woodshed three times within the next week. Each time, the inherent evil of the place drove her out. By this time, she was thoroughly angry with herself and with the woodshed. I suppose she told herself, you think that poor woman's body is buried under the dirt? I suppose you don't think that that's the very first place the police would look if they thought a murder had been committed. The week went slowly. She had already made the little house immaculate. Now she looked for things to do. From a bolt of butcher's linen that she found in the cellar, she made drapes for her bedroom. She painted, she scrubbed, she planted a small garden, and for the sake of economy, she bought a young pig, planning to have it butchered and stored in the cooperative freezer plant. When she visited the plant, a pleasant young man named Barney Pace gave her the key to her private locker. That will be four dollars, he told her. The plant is always open, but any time you want butchering done, you have to come around in the daytime. I'll be here, or my dad. They walked back into the cool depths of the freezer plant. Barney borrowed her key back and opened her locker for her. I'll probably butcher your shoat in the cool of the evening, he told her. The meat will go in here. The locker was about the size of a file cabinet drawer. When Barney opened it, a wisp of white vapor curled out. My, she said, it's certainly cold enough. She glanced around. What in the world do you keep in those big lockers? The big lockers were similar to her own, but many times larger. Farmers rent them, Barney told her. They can store whole beef carcasses in them. In the old days, they used to butcher at home and pickle the beef for the winter. Now they have prime meat the year round. Anytime they want a roast or a steak, they just come in and get it. People in town do the same thing. Buy beef when it's cheap and store it. On her next trip to town, Mary stopped at the library. With her teaching background, she was able to establish 
in immediate and warm friendship with a librarian whose name was Margaret Miller. They chatted for two hours in between the book borrowers. Mrs. Miller was voluble, frankly delighted that a genuine book lover had moved to Morrow Corners. Yes, she agreed. It was a lovely little house. And yes, she remembered when Mrs. Winowski disappeared. Everyone was sure that the terrible-tempered Henry had murdered her. Such a pity that nothing could be done about it. He used to beat her terribly, people said. Yes, she had known her. A thin little woman, always looking over her shoulder, always afraid. And yes, she would be delighted to come and visit with Mary. This last was when Mary Comstock finally got up to leave. From the library, Mary went straight to the sheriff's substation. The deputy in charge was a big, slow-moving man with a red face and sympathetic eyes. His name was Redfield. He pulled out a chair for Mary and sat down across from her. Now then, he said pleasantly, what can I do for you, Mrs. Comstock? She said absently, Miss, and before I tell you anything at all, I want you to know that I am not a silly or timid woman. He said reassuringly, wouldn't occur to me at all, Miss Comstock. She told him about her sensation whenever she went into the woodshed. When she finished, she half expected to find him smiling at her, humoring her. He wasn't smiling. He shook his head slowly. There isn't anybody under that woodshed, if that's what you're thinking. I know because I helped dig it up. You see, ma'am, we're all pretty sure that Henry Winowski killed his wife, but being sure and proving it are two different matters. Redfield leaned back in his chair. About that feeling you get when you go into the woodshed, well, I just don't know. I sure wouldn't laugh at you for it, though. An old farmer by the name of Hansen hung himself in his own barn, not far from my place. I helped cut him down. I still get goose flesh when I go near his place, and I'm a pretty hard-headed man. Mary asked, That man, that Winowski, he's still walking around as free as a bird? As free as a bird makes me want to turn in my badge. She never told any of her friends that she was afraid her husband would kill her? I mean, if she did, couldn't you arrest him on suspicion? She never had any friends. Henry wouldn't let her. No, she just disappeared from the face of the earth. She used to deliver eggs to a dozen customers here in town. One day she just didn't show up. The next day Henry brought the eggs around himself and said his wife had gone home to visit her folks for a spell. They're Polish people, live in a town in Minnesota. Did you write to see if she ever got there? Mary asked. Did better than that. I telephoned. Cost the town a few dollars, I guess. You see, Henry had been in trouble with me before. Once he beat his wife so bad, she had to be put in the hospital. Brought her in himself and damned if he didn't want to know how much it was going to cost before he'd leave her. She wouldn't make a complaint against him, though. Too scared. Said she fell down the cellar stairs and her with her fist and boot marks all over her. After she turned up missing, I went out there and nosed around. Couldn't do too much without evidence, but I got her people's address from Henry, and I called them right away. They hadn't heard from her in years. I asked Henry how she left town. He told me she went on a Greyhound bus. I checked at the depot, and they hadn't sold a ticket to anywhere in Minnesota for months. So I arrested Henry right then and there. That's when we searched the place. And we really searched it. We poked into every foot of ground with iron rods. Used bloodhounds too. Dug up the cellar. Dug up your woodshed every inch of it. But she wasn't there. Mary pitting the vanished Mrs. Wanowski said, The poor creature. What do you suppose he did with her? Redfield shrugged. Don't know, ma'am. Baby drove off in the woods somewhere and buried her. I just hope that someday her body, what's left of it, will turn up. I'd like to see Henry hang. After leaving the sheriff's office, Mary drove down the street to the freezer locker to pick up chops for supper. Young Barney Pace was at the meat block. He smiled as she came in. Good day, Miss Comstock. Get something from your locker for you? She handed him the key. Please, Barney, cut me off two nice rib chops, if you will. Sure, ma'am. She watched him cut the young pig's carcass. I wish I could afford to rent a bigger locker and buy a quarter of beef, she said pensively, though I suppose it would be foolish to have that much meat stored away just for myself. 
Barney wrapped up her chops in brown paper and handed them to her. Not if you bought a rib quarter. You might think about it, Miss Constop. Beef's a lot cheaper that way. A tall, stoop-shouldered man pushed past the meat block into the locker storage room. He wore faded denims and a much-washed blue shirt that stretched tautly across his hulking frame. Barney said in a low voice, That's the man who used to own your place. You know him? You mean that's Mr. Wanowski? That's him. Killed his wife and got away with it. Mary listened to Barney's chatter with only half an ear. She had glimpsed Henry Wanowski's face. She had seen the brutal jaw and the narrowed, avaricious eyes. All her life, she had prided herself in not judging people by appearance. But now she had seen a face that she knew was capable of murder. After a minute or two, Wanowski came stalking back from the locker room. Over his shoulder, he had slung the carcass of a sheep. Wrapped in butcher linen, the frozen flesh showed dark red through the cloth. The legs of the carcass stuck rigidly out in all directions. Mary Comstock breathed a soft, oh no, and hurried to her car. She found Deputy Redfield dozing at his desk and was impatient with him. Sheriff, she said, Henry Wanowski has one of those big lockers at the freezer plant. I can't arrest him for that. Every farm in the valley has a locker. She bent forward, throwing the words like darts. Did you look in his locker when his wife disappeared? Redfield swallowed, Lord, he said. No. He stood up, no longer looking kindly but grim and purposeful. Miss Constock, he said, I'm three kind of a fool. It's just that a thing like that wouldn't occur. You'd better stay here. She shook her head. I'm going with you. Barney Pace smiled again when Deputy Redfield walked in with Mary behind him. He saw the expression on Redfield's face and stopped smiling. What's the matter, Ed? Have you got a duplicate key to Henry Wanowski's locker? No, I've got a key to the regular lock, but Henry put his own padlock on when he rented it. Never mind, give me the key you've got and fetch a flashlight. Barney opened Wanowski's locker with a duplicate key. The padlock was attached to a chain and there was enough slack so that the door could be opened about an inch. A wisp of cold vapor ghosted out and Mary drew back a step in spite of herself. Redfield looked at the padlock. Cheap job, he grunted, and sent Barney to fetch a hammer and screwdriver. The deputy placed a screwdriver in the staple of the padlock and struck the base with a hammer. At the second blow, the staple snapped open. Glad I didn't have to break it, Redfield said. He opened the door wide and focused Barney's flashlight. Inside the locker were nearly a dozen objects, the lower ones blurred by heavy coats of frost. They were lumpy, amorphous, unrecognizable. Redfield dragged one out. It went thump on the floor, and Mary gasped. Barney said hog. He said later, another hog. Sheep, side of beef. The last of the cloth-wrapped bundles was frozen solidly to the floor of the locker. Barney had to help Redfield tug and haul it until it slid finally out into the floor. It was long and there was a round protuberance at one end. Mary looked away, a head she thought, a woman's head. She decided that she was going to be sick. And then Redfield grunted again, be a carcass. That's all, shove them back in, will you, Barney? Try to get them in the same order we took them out. To Mary Comstock, he said, I'm almost glad we didn't find anything. I've got some beef of my own in this room. Don't think I'd care to eat any of it. We'd, well... You know what I mean. She said in a small voice, I suppose you think I'm a perfect simpleton? Don't think anything of the kind. You were dead right. It had to be checked out. In the days that followed, Mary's love for the little salt box house deepened in direct proportion to revulsion for the woodshed. More and more, she was drawn to the place in spite of her abhorrence, just as a motorist will glance and glance again at the bloody and crumpled victims of an accident seen in passing. Mary's new friend, the librarian, visited her frequently. Deputy Redfield dropped in twice for iced tea, and if he was a mite disappointed that Mary kept no beer on ice for visiting lawmen, he nevertheless came the second time. She was happy, she told herself. The woodshed was only the minor flaw that set off the perfection of the whole. She was frankly interested in the Wanowski case, 
and she pumped Redfield about it shamelessly on both his visits. Once, he became a little annoyed. This is a country village, Mary, he told her. But we've got access to the State Bureau investigation, and those are crack men. I told Henry Wanowski for four days after I first picked them up, and those men helped me search the place. There wasn't any loose soil. There weren't any bloodstains in the house or in Henry's truck. And I mean to tell you, those state detectives went over everything with microscopes. It wasn't just a matter of a, a hick sheriff like me making a halfway search. I'm sorry, Ed, she told him. I didn't mean to sound as if I thought you weren't capable. Have some more tea and we'll talk about something else. A few days after Redfield's second visit, Mary set out half a dozen pots of impatience in the front garden. When she was finished, she picked up the empty pots and started for the house. On the way to the back door, she stopped. You've got a perfectly good shed for these things, she told herself, and you're not going to let your imagination keep you from using it. She turned toward the woodshed. As she came closer to it, she felt a familiar loathing. The day was perfectly still and hot. When she opened the door, a blue bottle fly. It could have been the same one she had seen weeks earlier, was still bumbling against the window, folding the door all the way back. She stepped aside into the same aura of brooding melancholy that she had felt before. Now, don't just set those pots down and run, she told herself firmly. You take your time and stack them neatly in the corner where they belong. As she stepped towards the corner, she felt a rush of air. Turning with an involuntary cry of fright, she saw the heavy door slammed to behind her, cutting off most of the light, so that she stood in semi-darkness. In near panic, she ran to the door. There was a wooden latch piece stuck through it from the outside that was supposed to make it possible to lift the heavy wooden bar from the inside. She pried up on it too quickly and it snapped in her hands with a powdery pull of dry rot. Don't panic, she whispered. Keep a grip on yourself. Get a stick or something and stick it through the latch hole. There was no stick small enough to go through the hole. The door was solid and tight-fitting. Mary tried for ten minutes to get it open before she stopped to catch her breath. Standing in the dark, panting, she glanced down at the floor. Of course, she could dig her way out. She searched for a small log and found one. It was beveled at the point where some forgotten woodsman had chopped it. The point sank easily into the dirt close to the wall, and she remembered what Redfield said. We drug every inch of that woodshed up. When she had loosened a quantity of the dry soil, she scooped it aside with her hands and scraped some more with a sharp stick. She had made a hole almost two feet deep when she came across the butcher linen. The bones that were wrapped in the linen were dirt stained. She thought at first that they were wood chips, except that no wood chip should be shaped like a human skull. Half an hour later, she broke through the ground outside the woodshed. It was typical of Mary Comstock that she stopped to wash and put on a clean dress before she went to fetch Deputy Redfield. Later, he told her about it. We went out and got him this afternoon. He was like an animal. It took three of us to rustle him down, and then we had to chain him up with cow chain. It was evening now, and a coolness sifted itself over them as they sat on a front porch. Then it was Mrs. Wanowski's body. No doubt about it, the bones in her throat crushed when he strangled her. Mary shivered, poor woman. Henry was pretty clever at that. If you can ever call a murderer clever, he killed her and put her body in the freezer locker, just like you figured. Then he sat back and laughed while we tore up the ground out there, looking for her. Then he figured the safest place in the world was a place we had already searched. He was right about that, too. Or he would have been if you hadn't gotten trapped in there. Mary warmed his coffee. I wonder, though, why he sold the place. You'd think he'd want to stay where he could keep his eye on it. You know how that woodshed spooked you, Mary? Maybe it had the same effect on him. And he had no reason to believe anyone would go digging the shed up. Like I say, if you hadn't gotten trapped in there, say, how did that happen anyway? Mary said slowly. The wind, I guess. I had the door swung all the way back, so it couldn't have closed by itself. Redfield frowned. 
I do a little farming, Mary, so I watch the weather. There wasn't enough wind today to move the wheat, let alone a heavy door. I know, she said softly. In the morning, she went out to the woodshed to see how well Redfield's men had filled in the hole they had made in exhuming poor Mrs. Wanowski's body. They had leveled it and tramped the dirt back down so it looked as it had looked before. Inside it was cool and faintly musty and nothing more. It felt exactly as a woodshed should feel. Beyond the Door by J. Paul Souter You haven't told me yet how it happened. I said to Mrs. Malkin, she set her lips and eyed me sharply. Didn't you talk with the coroner, sir? Yes, of course, I admitted. But as I understand, you found my uncle. I thought, well, I wouldn't care to say anything about it. She interrupted with decision. This housekeeper of my uncle's was somewhat taller than I and much heavier. Two physical preponderances which afford any woman possessing them an advantage over the inferior male. She appeared a subject for diplomacy rather than argument. Noting her ample jaw, her breadth of cheek, the unsentimental glint of her eye, I decided on conciliation. I placed a chair for her, there in my Uncle Godfrey's study, and dropped into another myself. At least, before we go over the other parts of the house, suppose we rest a little. I suggested, in my most unctuous manner, the place rather gets on one's nerves. Don't you think so? It was sheer luck. I claim no credit for it. My chance reflection found the weak spot in her fortifications. She replied to it with an undoubted smack of satisfaction. It's more than seven years that I've been doing for Mr. Sarstens, bringing him his meals regular as clockwork, keeping the house clean, as clean as he let me, and sleeping at my own home on nights. And all that time I've said over and over there ain't a house in New York the equal of this for queerness. Nor anywhere else, I encouraged her with a laugh, and her confidences opened another notch. You're likely right in that too, sir, as I've said to poor Mr. Sarston many a time. It's all well enough, says I, to have bugs for a hobby. You can afford it, and being a bachelor and by yourself, you don't have to consider other people's likes and dislikes. And it's all well enough if you want to, says I, to keep thousands and thousands of them in cabinets all over the place, the way you do. But when it comes to pinning them on the wall in regular armies, I says, and on the ceiling of your own study, and even on different parts of the furniture, so the body don't know what awful things she's going to find under her hand of a sudden when she does the dusting, why then, I says to him, it's driving a decent woman too far. And did he never try to reform his ways when you told him that? I asked, smiling. To be frank with you, Mr. Robinson, when I talked like that to him, he generally raised my pay. And what was a body to do then? I can't see how Lucy Lawton stood the place as long as she did. I observed watching Mrs. Malkin's red face very closely. She swallowed the bait and leaned forward, hands on knees. Poor girl, it got on her nerves. But she was the quiet kind. You never saw her, sir? I shook my head. One of them slim, faded girls with light hair and hardly a word to say for herself. I don't believe she got to know the next-door neighbor in the whole year she lived with your uncle. She was an orphan, wasn't she, sir? Yes, I said. Godfrey Sarston and I were her only living relatives. That was why she came from Australia to stay with him after her father's death. Mrs. Malcolm nodded. I was hoping that putting a check on my eagerness, I could lead her to a number of things I greatly desired to know. Up to the time I had induced the housekeeper to show me through this strange house of my Uncle Godfrey's, the whole affair had been a mystery of lips which closed and faces which were averted at my approach. Even the coroner seemed unwilling to tell me just how my uncle had died. Did you understand she was going to live with him, sir? asked Mrs. Malkin, looking hard at me. I confirmed myself to a nod. Well, so did I, yet after a year, back she went. She went suddenly, I suggested. So suddenly that I never knew a thing about it till after she was gone. I came to do my chores one day and she was here. I came the next and she had started back to Australia. That's how sudden she went. 
They must have had a falling out, I conjectured. I suppose it was because of the house. Maybe it was, and maybe it wasn't. You know of other reasons? I have eyes in my head, she said, but I'm not going to talk about it. Shall we be getting on now, sir? I tried another lead. I hadn't seen my uncle in five years, you know. He seemed terribly changed. He was not an old man by any means, yet when I saw him at the funeral, I paused expectantly. To my relief, she responded readily. He looked that way for the last few months, especially that last week. I spoke to him about it two days before, before it happened, sir, and told him he'd do well to see the doctor again, but he cut me off short. My sister took sick the same day and I was called out of town. The next time I saw him, he was... She paused and then went on sobbing. To think of him lying there in that awful place and calling and calling for me, as I know he must, and me not around to hear him. As she stopped again, suddenly, and threw a suspicious glance at me, I hastened to insert a matter-of-fact question. Did he appear ill on that last day? Not so much ill as... Yes, I prompted. She was silent a long time, while I waited, afraid that some word of mine had brought back her former attitude of hostility. Then she seemed to make up her mind. I oughtn't to say another word. I've said too much already. But you've been liberal with me, sir, and I know something you've a right to be told, which I'm thinking no one else is going to tell you. Look at the bottom of his study door a minute, sir. I followed her direction. What I saw led me to drop to my hands and knees, the better to examine it. Why should you put a rubber strip on the bottom of his door? I asked, getting up. She replied with another enigmatical suggestion. Look at these, if you will, sir. You'll remember that he slept in the study. That was his bed, over there in the alcove. Bolts? I exclaimed. And I reinforced sight with touch by shooting one of them back and forth a few times. Double bolts on the inside of his bedroom door? An upstairs room at that? What was the idea? Mrs. Malcolm portentously shook her head and sighed, as one unburdening her mind. Only this I can say, sir. He was afraid of something. Terribly afraid, sir. Something that came in the night. What was it? I demanded. I don't know, sir. It was in that night that it happened, I asked. She nodded then as if the prologue were over, as if she had prepared my mind sufficiently. She produced something from under her apron. She must have been holding it there all the time. It's his diary, sir. It was lying here on the floor. I saved it for you before the police could get their hands on it. I opened the little book. One of the sheets near the back was crumpled, and I glanced at it idly. What I read there impelled me to slap the cover shut again. Did you read this? I demanded. She met my gaze frankly. I looked into it, sir, just as you did. Only just looked into it. Not for worlds would I do even that again. I know some reference here to a slab in the cellar. What slab is that? It covers an old dried up well, sir. Will you show it to me? You can find it for yourself, sir, if you wish. I'm not going down there, she said decidedly. Oh, well, I've seen enough for today, I told her. I'll take the diary back to my hotel and read it. I did not return to my hotel, however. In my one brief glance into the little book, I had seen something which had bitten into my soul. Only a few words, but they had brought me very near to that queer, solitary man who had been my uncle. I dismissed Mrs. Malkin and remained in the study. There was the fitting place to read the diary he had left behind him. His personality lingered like a vapor in that study. I settled into his deep Morris chair and turned it to catch the light from the single narrow window, the light, doubtless, by which he had written much of his work on entomology. That same struggling illumination played shadowy tricks with a host of wall-crucified insects, which seemed engaged in a united effort to crawl upward in sinuous lines. Some of their number, impaled to the ceiling itself, peered queeringly down on the aspiring multitude. The whole house, with its crisp dead, rustling in any vagrant breeze, 
brought back to my mind the hand that had pinned them, one by one on wall and ceiling and furniture. A kindly hand, I reflected, though eccentric, one not to be turned aside from its single hobby. When quiet, peering Uncle Godfrey went, there passed out another of those scientific enthusiasts whose passion for exact truth in some one direction has extended the bounds of human knowledge. Could not his unquestioned merits have been balanced against his sin? Was it necessary to even-handed justice that he died face to face with horror, struggling with the thing he most feared? I ponder the question still, though his body strangely bruised has been long at rest. The entries in the little book began with the 15th of June. Everything before that date had been torn out. There in one room where it had been written, I read my Uncle Godfrey's diary. It is done. I am trembling so that the words will hardly form under my pen, but my mind is collected. My course was for the best. Suppose I had married her. She would have been unwilling to live in this house. At the outset, her wishes would have come between me and my work, and that would have been only the beginning. As a married man, I could not have concentrated properly. I could not have surrounded myself with the atmosphere indispensable to the writing of my book. My scientific message would never have been delivered. As it is, though my heart is sore, I shall stifle these memories and work. I wish I had been more gentle with her, especially when she sank to her knees before me. Tonight, she kissed my hand. I should not have repulsed her so roughly. Particular, my words could have been better chosen. I said to her bitterly, Get up and don't nuzzle my hand like a dog. She rose without a word and left me. How was I to know that within an hour? I am largely to blame. Yet, had I taken any other course afterward than the one I did, the authorities would have misunderstood. Again, there followed a space from which the sheets had been torn, for from the 16th of July, all the pages were intact. Something had come over the writing, too. It was so precise and clear, my Uncle Godfrey's characteristic hand, but the letters were less firm. As the entries approached the end, this difference became still more marked. Here follows, then, the whole of his story, or as much of it as will ever be known. I shall let his words speak for him without further interruption. My nerves are becoming more seriously affected. If certain annoyances do not shortly cease, I shall be obliged to procure medical advice. To be more specific, I find myself at times obsessed by an almost uncontrollable desire to descend to the cell and lift a slab over the old well. I never have yielded to the impulse, but it had persisted for minutes together with such intensity that I've had to put work aside and literally hold myself down in my chair. This insane desire comes only in the dead of night when its disquieting effect is heightened by the various noises peculiar to the house. For instance, there often is a draft of air along the hallways which causes a rustling among the specimens impaled on the walls. Lately, too, there have been other nocturnal sounds, strongly suggestive of the busy clamor of rats and mice, this calls for investigation. I've been at considerable expense to make the house proof against rodents, which might destroy some of my best specimens. If some structural defect has opened a way for them, the situation must be corrected at once. July 17th. The foundations and cellars were examined today by a workman. He states positively that there is no place of ingress for rodents. He contented himself with looking at the slab over the old well, without lifting it, July 19th. While I was sitting in this chair late last night, writing the impulse to descend to the cellar, suddenly came upon me with tremendous insistence. I yielded, which perhaps was as well, for at least I satisfied myself that the disquiet which possesses me has no external cause. The long journey through the hallways was difficult. Several times I was keenly aware of the same sound. Perhaps I should say the same impressions of sounds that I had erroneously laid to rats. I'm convinced now that they are more symptoms of my nervous condition, 
Further indication of this came in the fact that, as I opened the cellar door, the small noises abruptly ceased. There was no final scamper of tiny footfalls to suggest rats disturbed at their occupation. Indeed, I was conscious of a certain impression of expectant silence, as if the thing behind the noises, whatever it was, had paused to watch me enter its domain. Throughout my time in the cellar, I seemed surrounded by this same atmosphere. Sheer nerves, of course. In the main, I held myself well under control. As I was about to leave the cellar, however, I unguardedly glanced back over my shoulder at the stone slab covering the old well. At that, a violent tremor came over me, and losing all command, I rushed back up the cellar stairs, thence to the study. My nerves are playing me sorry tricks. July 30th. For more than a week, all has been well. The tone of my nerves seems distinctly better. Mrs. Malkin, who has remarked several times lately upon my paleness, expressed a conviction this afternoon that I'm nearly my old self again. This is encouraging. I was beginning to fear that the severe strain of the past few months had left an indelible mark upon me. With continued health, I shall be able to finish my books by spring. July 31st. Mrs. Malcolm remained rather late tonight in connection with some item of housework, and it was quite dark when I returned to my study from bolting the street door after her. The blackness of the upper hall, which the former owner of the house inexplicably failed to wire for electricity, was profound. As I came to the top of the second flight of stairs, something clutched at my foot and for an instant almost pulled me back. I freed myself and ran to the study. August 3rd. Again, the awful insistence. I sit here with this diary upon my knee, and it seems that fingers of iron are tearing at me. I will not go. My nerves may be utterly unstrung again. I fear they are, but I am still their master. August 4th. I did not yield last night. After a bitter struggle, which must have lasted nearly an hour, the desire to go to the cellar suddenly departed. I must not give in at any time. August 5th. Tonight. The rat noises. I shall call them that, for want of a more appropriate term, are very noticeable. I went to the length of unbolting my door and stepping into the hallway to listen. After a few minutes, I seemed to be aware of something large and gray, watching me from the darkness at the end of the passage. This is a bizarre statement, of course, but it exactly describes my impression. I withdrew hastily into the study and bolted the door. Now that my nerves conditions is so palpably affecting the optic nerve, I must not much longer delay seeing a specialist, but how much shall I tell him? August 8th. Several times tonight, while sitting here at my work, I have seemed to hear soft footsteps in the passage. Nerves again, of course, or else some new trick of the mind among the specimens on the wall. August 9th. By my watch, it is four o'clock in the morning. My mind is made up to record the experience I have passed through. Calmness may come that way. Feeling rather fatigued last night, from the strain of a weary day of research, I retired. My sleep was more refreshing than usual, as it is likely to be when one is genuinely tired. I awakened, however, it must have been more than an hour ago with a start of tremendous violence. There was moonlight in the room. My nerves were on edge, but for a moment I saw nothing unusual. Then glancing toward the door, I perceived what appeared to be a thin white fingers thrust under it, exactly as if someone outside the door were trying to attract my attention in that manner. I rose and turned on the light, but the fingers were gone. Needless to say, I did not open the door. I write the occurrences down just as it took place, or as it seemed, but I cannot trust myself to comment upon it. August 10th, have fastened heavy rubber strips on the bottom of my bedroom door. August 15th, all quiet for several nights. I'm hoping that the rubber strips 
being something definite and tangible, have had a salutary effect upon my nerves. Perhaps I shall not need to see a doctor. August 17th. Once more, I've been aroused from sleep. The interruption seemed to come always at the same hour, about three o'clock in the morning. I have been dreaming of the well in the cellar, the same dream over and over, everything black except the slab, and a figure with bowed head and averted face sitting there. Also, I had vague dreams about a dog. Can it be that my last words to her have impressed that on my mind? I must pull myself together. In particular, I must not, under any pressure, yield and visit the cellar after nightfall. August 18th. I'm feeling much more hopeful. Mrs. Malcolm remarked on it while serving dinner. This improvement is due largely to a consultation I've had with Dr. Sartwell, the distinguished specialist in nervous diseases. I went into full details with him, expecting certain reservations. He scouted the idea that my experiences could be other than purely mental. When he recommended a change of scene, which I had been expecting, I told him positively that it was out of the question. He said then that with the aid of a tonic and an occasional sleeping draft, I'm likely to progress well enough at home. This is distinctly encouraging. I erred in not going to him at the start. Without doubts, most, if not all, of my hallucinations could have been averted. I have been suffering a needless penalty from my nerves for an action I took solely in the interests of science. I have no disposition to tolerate it further. From today I shall report regularly to Dr. Sartwell. August 19th. Used a sleeping draft last night with gratifying results. The doctor says I must repeat the dose for several nights until my nerves are well under control again. August 21st. All well. It seems that I have found the way out. A very simple and prosaic way. I might have avoided much needless annoyance by seeking expert advice at the beginning. Before retiring last night, I unbolted my study door, took a turn up and down the passage. I felt no trepidation. The place was as it used to be before these fancies assailed me. A visit to the cellar after nightfall will be the test for my complete recovery, but I am not yet quite ready for that. Patience. August 22nd. I've just read yesterday's entry. Thinking to steady myself, it is cheerful, almost gay, and there are other entries, like it in preceding pages. I am a mouse in the grip of a cat. Let me have freedom for ever so short a time, and I begin to rejoice at my escape. Then the paw descends again. It is four in the morning, the usual hour. I retired rather late last night after administering the draft. Instead of the dreamless sleep which heretofore had followed the use of the drug, the slumber into which I fell was punctuated by recurrent visions of the slab with the bowed figure upon it. Also, I had one poignant dream in which the dog was involved. At length I awakened and reached mechanically for the light switch beside my bed. When my hand encountered nothing, I suddenly realized the truth. I was standing in my study with my other hand upon the doorknob. It required only a moment, of course, to find the light and switch it on. I saw then that the bolt had been drawn back. The door was quite unlocked. My awakening must have interrupted me in the very act of opening it. I could hear something moving restlessly in the passage outside the door. August 23rd. I must beware of sleeping at night. Without confiding the fact to Dr. Sartwell, I began to take the drug in the daytime. At first, Mrs. Malkin's views on the subject were pronounced, but my explanation of doctor's orders has silenced her. I am awake for breakfast and supper and sleep in the hours between. She is leaving me each evening a cold lunch to be eaten at midnight. August 26. Several times I have caught myself nodding in my chair. The last time I am sure that, on arousing, I perceive the rubber strip under the door bent inward, as if something were pushing it from the other side. I must not, under any circumstances, permit myself to fall asleep. September 2nd. Mrs. Malcolm is to be away because of her sister's illness. 
I cannot help dreading her absence. Though she is here only in the daytime, even that companionship is very welcome. September 3rd. Let me put this into writing. The mere labor of composition has a soothing influence upon me. God knows I need such an influence now as never before. In spite of all my watchfulness, I fell asleep tonight. Across my bed, I must have been utterly exhausted. The dream I had was the other one about the dog. I was patting the creature's head over and over. I awoke at last to find myself in darkness and in a standing position. There was a suggestion of chill and earthiness in the air. While I was drowsily trying to get my bearings, I became aware that something was muzzling my hand as a dog might do. Still saturated with my dream, I was not greatly astonished. I extended my hand to pat the dog's head. That brought me to my senses. I was standing in the cellar. The thing before me was not a dog. I cannot tell how I fled back up the cellar stairs. I know, however, that as I turned, the slab was visible in spite of the darkness, with something sitting upon it. All the way up the stairs, hands snatched at my feet. The entry seemed to finish this diary, for blank pages followed it, but I remembered the crumpled sheet near the back of the book. It was partly torn out as if a hand had clutched it convulsively. The writing on it, too, was markedly in contrast to the precise, albeit nervous, penmanship of even the last entry I had perused. I was forced to hold the scrawl up to the light to decipher it. This is what I read. My hand keeps on writing in spite of myself. What is this? I do not wish to write, but it compels me. Yes, yes, I will tell the truth. I will tell the truth. A heavy blot followed, partly covering the writing. With difficulty, I made it out. The guilt is mine. Mine only. I loved her too well, yet I was unwilling to marry, though she entreated me on her knees, though she kissed my hand. I told her my scientific work came first. She did it herself. I was not expecting that. I swear I was not expecting it, but I was afraid the authorities would misunderstand. So I took what seemed the best course. She had no friends here who would inquire. It is waiting outside my door. I feel it. It compels me through my thoughts. My hands keep on writing. I must not fall asleep. I must think only of what I am writing. I must. Then came the words I had seen when Mrs. Malcolm had handed me the book. They were written very large in places the pen had dug through the paper. Though they were scrawled, I read them at a glance. Not the slab in the cellar, not that. Oh my God, anything but that, anything. By what strange compulsion was the hand forced to write down what was in the brain, even to the ultimate thoughts, even to those final words? The gray light from outside slanting down through two dull little windows sank into the sodden hole near the inner wall. The corner and I stood in the cellar but not too near the hole. A small, demonstrative, dark man, the chief of detectives, stood a little apart from us, his eyes intent, his natural animation suppressed. We were watching the stooped shoulders of a police constable who was angling in the well. See anything, Walters? inquired the detective raspingly. The policeman shook his head. The little man turned his questioning to me. You're quite sure, he demanded. Ask the coroner. He saw the diary, I told him. I'm afraid there can be no doubt, the coroner confirmed in his heavy, tired voice. He was an old man with lackluster eyes. It had seemed best to me, on the whole, that he should read my uncle's diary. His position entitled him to all the available facts. What we were seeking in the well might especially concern him. He looked at me opaquely now, while the policeman bent double again. Then he spoke like one who reluctantly and at last does his duty. He nodded toward the slab of gray stone which lay in the shadow to the left of the well. It doesn't seem very heavy, does it? He suggested in an undertone. I shook my head. Still, it's stone, I demurred. A man would have to be rather strong to lift it. To lift it, yes. He glanced about the cellar. 
Mm, I forgot, he said abruptly. It is in my office as part of the evidence. He went on half to himself. A man, even though not very strong, could take a stick, for instance, the stick that is now in my office, and prop up the slab. If he wished to look into the well, he whispered. The policeman interrupted, straightening again with a groan and laying his electric torch behind the well. It's breaking my back, he complained. There's dirt down there. It seems loose, but I can't get through it. Somebody will have to go down. The detective cut in. I'm lighter than you, Walters. I'm not afraid, sir. I didn't say you were. The little man snapped. There's nothing down there anyway, though we'll have to prove that, I suppose. He glanced truculently at me, but went on talking to the constable. Rig the rope around me, and don't bungle a knot. I have no intention of falling into the place. There is something there, whispered the coroner, slowly to me. His eyes left the little detective, and the policeman, carefully trying and testing knots, and turned again to the square slab of stone. Suppose, while a man was looking into that hole, with the stone propped up, he should accidentally knock the prop away. He was still whispering. A stone so light that he could prop it up wouldn't be heavy enough to kill him, I objected. No, he laid a hand on my shoulder. Not to kill him, to paralyze him. If it struck the spine in a certain way, to render him helpless but not unconscious, the post-mortem would disclose that through the bruises on the body. The policeman and the detective had adjusted the knots to their satisfaction. They were bickering now as to the details of the descent. Would that cause death, I whispered. You must remember that the housekeeper was absent for two days. In two days, even the pressure... He stared at me hard to make sure that I understood. With a head down, again the policeman interrupted. I'll stand at the well if you gentlemen will grab the rope behind me. It won't be much of a pull. I'll take the brunt of it. We let the little man down with an electric torch strapped to his waist and some sort of implement, a trowel or a small spade in his hand. It seemed a long time before his voice, curiously hollow, directed us to stop. The hole must have been deep. We braced ourselves. I was second, the coroner last. The policeman relieved his strain somewhat by snagging the rope against the edge of the well. A noise like muffled scratching reached us from below. Occasionally, the rope shook and shifted slightly at the edge of the hole. At last, the detective's hollow voice spoke. What does he say? The coroner demanded. The policeman turned his square dog face toward us. I think he's found something, he explained. The rope jerked and shifted again. Some sort of struggle seemed to be going on below. The weight suddenly increased and a suddenly lessened as if something had been grasped. Then I managed to elude the grasp and slip away. I could catch the detective's rapid breathing now, also the sound of an articulate speech in his hollow voice. The next words I caught came more clearly. They were a command to pull up. At the same time, the weight of the rope grew heavier and remained so. The policeman's big shoulders began straining rhythmically. Altogether directed, take it easy, pull when I do. Slowly the rope passed through our hands. Then it tightened suddenly and there was an ejaculation from below, just below. Still holding fast, the policeman contrived to stoop over and look. He translated the ejaculation for us. Let's down a little. He struck with it against the side. We slackened the rope until the detective's voice gave us the word again. The rhythmic tugging continued. Something dark appeared, quite abruptly at the top of the hole. My nerves leapt in spite of me, but it was merely the top of the detective's head. His dark hair, something white, came next, his pale face with staring eyes. Then his shoulders bowed forward, the better to support what was in his arms. Then I looked away, but as he laid his burden down at the side of the well, the detective whispered to us, he had her covered up with dirt, covered up, he began to laugh, a little high cackle like a child's, to the corner, took him by the shoulder and deliberately shook him, then the policeman, 
let him out of the cellar. It was not then but afterward that I put my question to the coroner. Tell me, I demanded. People pass there at all hours. Why didn't my uncle call for help? I have thought of that, he replied. I believe he did call. I think probably he screamed, but his head was down and he couldn't raise it. His screams must have been swallowed up in the well. You're sure he didn't murder her? He had given me that assurance before, but I wished it again. Almost sure, he declared, though it was on his account, undoubtedly, that she killed herself. Few of us are punished as accurately for our sins as he was. One should be thankful even for crumbs of comfort. I am thankful. But there are times when my uncle's face rises before me. After all, we were the same blood. Our sympathies had much in common under any given circumstances. Our thoughts and feelings must have been largely the same. I seemed to see him in that final death march along the unlighted passageway, obeying an imperative summon, going on step by step, down the stairway to the first floor, down the cellar stairs, at last, lifting the slab. I tried not to think of the final expiation. Yet, was it final? I wonder. Did the last door of all when it opened, find him willing to pass through, or was something waiting beyond that door?